What's up guys, Dr. Mike here. People often ask me, what's it really like to be a doctor? Hello, sick people and their loved ones. Come on. You gotta be kidding me. All right, all right, enough, enough, enough. Let's talk about what it's really like to be in the hospital. I've been at numerous hospitals. I've spent countless hours in hospitals. So I wanna share with you my journey of what it's like behind the scenes and share some really cool stories with you. Let's get started. I know what question you want answered first. Is there so much loving going on in the hospital that we just can't control ourselves? No. I have seen some residents hit it off. I've seen some doctors and nurses hit it off before and start dating outside of the hospital. So it does occur, but it rarely, probably never occurs to the extent that people are getting it on in janitorial closets. I will say this, I do work with some nurses who are in their 60s and they've told me that 20, 30 years ago, it was more like that. They did go and visit some doctors in the back rooms and in the boiler rooms. And maybe 20, 30 years ago before my time, it was more romantic and similar to Grey's Anatomy. Sorry for those of you who wanted this, but there's just not that much romance that goes on in hospitals. <laughs> Excuse me? Next topic, money. Everyone thinks that doctors are rich. The first thing I have to say right off the bat is med school is very expensive. Think Ferrari expensive, quarter million dollars expensive. Then the first three to five years of being a doctor out of medical school, you're being paid a resident salary, which is very low. When I was training, it ranged anywhere from 40 to $50,000 a year. Not a terrible salary, I agree with you, but you're working sometimes 80 to 100 hours a week. If you calculate what that comes out to hourly, you're making around nine to $10 an hour. That's less than minimum wage in some places. And then once you start a practice, you have to pay your own malpractice insurance, which is sky high for some specialties. To be a practicing OBGYN in New York City, you're paying sometimes $100,000, $200,000 a year alone for coverage. That's just coverage. Then if you wanna open up your own practice, you have to pay for the space. You wanna hire a nurse and a PA and a scribe and this and that, you have to pay for that as well. But guess what? You still have a quarter million dollars in loans that you haven't been able to pay back. So the whole notion that doctors are rich right off the bat and it's an easy career that you can just go on and make a lot of money, false, myth busted. My student loan debt upon graduating medical school because I had some scholarships was around 220,000 or so. During my residency, you would make payments and they wouldn't be large payments because they would be based on your income. It's called income-based repayment. But I noticed that after two years of making these payments, my amount that I owed actually went up because of the percentage. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. The next most common question probably deals with losing a patient. And being a resident, when you're on call, you're in the hospital at night and you're basically responsible for any emergen emergencies that go down. So if there's a code blue, which means that someone's heart has stopped, you're the one that has to run there to resuscitate them, to bring them back to life. So to answer the question, absolutely, I've lost patients on my watch. Not every resident or doctor handles death the same way. And we get a lot of coaching and education about what the right way to handle death uh, is. and. I don't think there's ever a right way, but the one good point that I've seen at these coaching sessions is that it's important to not forcefully hide your emotions. And that's a natural instinct that some people do. They say, I'm a doctor, I shouldn't cry. Showing emotion is not a bad thing. It's that when you let emotion take over you and it stops you from making quality decisions, that's where it sort of crosses in the, in the territory where it impedes your work. It's very difficult to find the words to share with the family members to help console them, but you're the person. You're the one that has to be there. I remember a specific story. One night I was on call and there was a code blue in the ICU. Um, there was a man, he was in his 90s and his heart stopped. We tried to resuscitate him. It was unsuccessful and he ended up passing and his wife of 65 plus years was sitting immediately outside of the room and I had to be the one to break the news to her. So I got on, uh, on my knee, I sort of held her hand and I explained to her everything what happened and she was in shock, rightfully so. She just lost the partner she's been living with for 
over half a century. So I told her what happened. I explained that she was very understanding and kind. And I realized there wasn't anything more I needed to say, but I couldn't leave. I still needed to be there. So I sat with her for probably 20 minutes on my knee, just holding her hand. And after 20 minutes of sitting there, she looked at me and just said, thank you. And that's what she needed. Luckily for me that I didn't have a page during that moment that I would have to leave. You want to give everyone the proper amount of time and have the conversation to its full capacity, right? To make sure that the person is okay with what happened. They understand everything that's going on. But remember, you're responsible for the entire hospital. So your pager is constantly going off. There's other medical emergencies happening simultaneously. So not only do you have to be very kind and understanding of what's going on, you also have to be realistic and explain to them that you're gonna be back, you're gonna have to deal with another emergency because you are the doctor that's responsible for the entire hospital. If you ever find yourself in a hospital and you see that the doctor is very stressed out or feels like they're not just giving you the proper amount of time, ask if something urgent is going on that they need to attend to first and so that they can come back maybe and explain to you what's going on in a little bit because it's very rare that a doctor is being rude just to be rude or a nurse is being rude just to be rude. Most of the time it's because we're very busy, especially nowadays with insurance companies clamping down on profits. The hospitals are often slightly understaffed and we want to give you the proper amount of time and oftentimes is, there's just so many things going on that we oftentimes can't. As important as it is to talk about moments of death in the hospital, there's also some really uplifting moments when it comes to life. Being a family medicine physician, I delivered just over 30 babies uh, in Overlook Medical Center. One of the moms that I had in the OB clinic, she had a very difficult pregnancy. She had a complication uh, regarding her gallbladder where she had to have her gallbladder removed while she was pregnant. She had a very protracted delivery, it was very long. I sat there probably with her, you know, for 20 hours. And we were doing checks every now and then to make sure that her cervix was still progressing and that we didn't need to uh, give her any medications. And it was progressing, but it was just progressing very slowly. And then at midnight, it's like the baby knew, it's like it's midnight, Dr. Mike is exhausted, it's time for me to poke my head out. So we started the delivery, baby came out, perfect, crying right away. I didn't have to spank the baby's bottom. Just kidding, you don't have to do that. Instantly take the baby and put the baby on the mom's chest so they can have some interaction. Looking at the mom's face immediately after de the delivery is such an amazing moment because it's a complex emotion that uh, she's showing. She's anxious, wants reassurance that the baby's okay, she's happy, she's excited. There's just so much emotion that comes out in that one first smile when the baby's first born. There's really nothing nothing else like it. Finally, let's talk about the inaccuracies that come with some of these TV shows. As a doctor, it's painful to watch them at times because there's a lot of medical errors that are made. They shock asystole with the paddles and not everybody understands that, but as a doctor, it's so frustrating to see them give bad medical care. In the TV dramas, doctors do everything. They meet the patient in the ER, they take them for the scans, they perform the scans, they read the scans. There's a lot of nursing care involved there and it's a shame that these medical dramas leave the nurses out. The nurse will not only take your vitals, they'll give you their medications pretty much the only interaction you have with a doctor is describing what's going on, hearing what the doctor's point of view is, and then that's pretty much it. The rest of the time you're being surrounded by uh, tech staff, MAs, nursing staff, and those are the people who are really the backbone of medicine that I applaud and I feel like don't get recognized enough in TV dramas. I hope you enjoyed hearing about my experiences in the hospital system. It's definitely an interesting place. As you can tell, I'm very passionate about it. So if you wanna learn more and you have some questions or comments, leave them down below as you know that I'm very active in the comment section. I have a fun proposition for you. If you get this video to 10,000 likes, which is very doable, you've done that for a lot of my videos already, I will watch a Grey's Anatomy episode or whatever show you guys want me to watch, leave it down below in the comments. Not only will I watch that episode, I will film myself watching the episode and talk about what's going on and it'll be a dedicated video on just that subject. I know a lot of you have asked me to watch Grey's Anatomy before and I've never seen an episode, so I think it's gonna be a fun challenge. Get this video to 10,000 likes. As always, stay happy and healthy.